All right. Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sneha Shrestha. I'm the Arts Program Manager at the Mithil Institute. Welcome to the Visiting Artist Fellowship Art Exhibition Opening Panel Discussion and Reception later. Um, we're going to start off with um, Hitesh, who will be speaking a little bit about the Mithil Institute, and then he will hand it over to Gina Kim. And then after that, the artists will be presenting their work. And then after that, um, there's going to be a little bit of questions from Gina Kim, a little discussion, and then there'll be some time for the audience to ask questions to the artists. And at the end, we will all head upstairs where the artist exhibition um, is up on the fourth floor. And we'll also have uh, samosas and chai and shakuras. You'll really get to mingle with the artists, look at some original artwork that the artists have brought. Um, and it's going to be a fantastic evening. So welcome. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Please come in. That's Neha, who also works with us. Uh, everyone, as Sneha is saying, welcome. Thank you, Sneha. Sneha um, is uh, the person who helps us run our arts program. She's also herself. A welcome. Please find seats. A very distinguished artist. In fact, it's worth saying, forgive me for saying so, with Sneha is the first living Nepali artist to have her work in the permanent collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. So she has run the program. Uh, Gina is here. Gina is the uh, head of our arts program at the Nippon Institute. I'll introduce her and I'll let you talk about the arts program uh, because I think you're more much more qualified. I just want to say that it's really wonderful to see you all here. It's really an honor to have the both of you here. Uh, I'm delighted by seeing the art I've seen. It was such an exciting process, the, the process of going through the uh, applications to arriving at these two extraordinary artists. So we're very happy to have you here. Thank you. So I won't take up much more time. I'll just introduce Professor Gina Kim, who is a friend. As I said, she leads our arts program with great vision and extraordinary energy. And uh, I say that so that I can ask even more of her than the ridiculous amounts that I asked her to do already. <laughs> but it is true. So Gina King, she's the George P. Bickford Professor of Indian and South Asian Art here at Harvard. As I said, she runs our arts program at the Middle Institute. She works on a very wide range of topics. They include text image relationships, female representations and patronage, reappropriation of sacred objects, post-colonial discourse in South and Southeast Asian art. She has a number of books, starting with Receptacle of the Sacred, Illustrated Manuscripts and the Buddhist Book Cult in South Asia, there's also Garland of Visions, Color, Tantra, and a Material History of Indian Painting. She's currently working on a number of things, including a monograph, which has a working title unless it's changed, Paper, Poti, and the Goddess, History of Baby Manuscripts and Gender in the Art of the Book in South Asia. That one looks at the extraordinary preponderance of goddess manuscripts in the corpus of painted manuscripts in medieval South Asia. You know, the goddess is... Uh, both under overstudied, but in fundamentally understudied, and Gina is really leading some extraordinary work on it, along with Vaishnavi, who has uh, been uh, on a little fellowship and has been studying also the goddess tradition. Um, you're also working on a representation of women in pre-modern South Asia uh, as a book project. And those are academic interests. In addition to academic interests, there's a public interest academic project that Gina is, has imagined, directed, somehow managed to do that the Middle Institute has played a small role in. It's a project on color and pigments in painting called Mapping Color and History. It's building a common source database for conservation specialists as well as anyone interested in the material aspects of color. It will have a searchable open source database for historical research on pigments. So if you want to know if something is ferrous sulfate as opposed to sodium nitrate, this is the database that will tell you in a, in a South Asian art object. Um, Gina, I should also mention that among the many things you've curated, and there's, the list is very long, you've currently curated this show that is on at Harvard, which I urge you all to go. The Salman was talking about it as I entered. Uh, 
water stories, which has some dis works by distinguished people, including Abdul Talla, who is coming here. So with that, let me turn over to Gina Kim. Gina, thank you. Well, uh, thank you for that very long and generous introduction. And I think Middle Institute played a, a role in anything I do, actually. So thank you. And uh, thank you for joining us for this Visiting Artist Exhibition Opening event. And uh, the, if this event is part of the Arts at the Middle Institute's uh, program, and to give you a little of background, and you, I mean, many of you who like this is the second or third or fourth time you have heard me speak about this, but I think it's uh, good to go back to the history of the program because it's not just a let yesterday we cooked up this. Actually, I was counting years, and uh, it turns out it's uh, this is a ninth year of the middle. South Asian Institute Visiting Artist Program. So it's ninth year. It's can 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 you believe it? It's it's uh, amazing actually to think that because we had the first cohort of South Asian Visiting Artist Fellows coming to our campus in fall 2015. and we started this uh, art initiative. Uh, I think thinking about this art program in, in you know, spring 2014 or fall 2014. So. This is sort of long time coming, and I'm like surprised. I was just surprised myself. I, I was doing my fingers like, <laughs> look, this is really <laughs> nine. Can it be possible? It's not eight. No, it's actually nine years. So, uh, really very excited. And one of the sort of hallmark is, uh, you know, the, the the goal was to really have this. Uh, <clears throat> a platform that would bring artists from South Asia to a campus for immersive experience with no strings attached. That's important, no strings attached. And uh, the program is made possible through generous funding from the Arts Advisory Council of the Luxury Mikhail and Family South Asia Institute. And the Arts Advisory Council is chaired by Dr. Dipti Mathur, without whose vision this program wouldn't have been possible. And with council members from different parts of South Asia, UK, and the US, who really share the mission of supporting the development, preservation, and promotion of arts of South Asia in the global stage. So uh, this program is designed to give uh, a precious opportunity for Harvard's community to engage with the artists from South Asia. And South Asia-based artists who are selected for fellowships have a rare opportunity to engage with the academic community at Harvard and its intellectual and cultural resources, which means actually that they are, and this is not a residency program. It's not an artist residency program. This is a very unique that it actually doesn't, we don't give you like studio space and, or ask you to create art. This is really giving you a sense of academic community, access to academic resources, libraries, archives, and museums. And that actually meant that we uh, will have actually artists, fellows that are often driven by, you know, research-based and kind of um, more. And another hallmark of this program is, I think often our visiting artists directly engage with pressing social, political, cultural, environmental issues and uh, through innovative artistic means and methods. So that's a sort of the context in which that we have this uh, program today. And we host two artists from South Asia per semester for two months. And I am thrilled that we have two visual artists from India with us this semester, both of whom are really deeply concerned with social issues and their artistic practice, whether finding self and community in a metropolis, like Bangalore, or anthropogenic ecological extinction. And both artists, as you will see today in this, their presentations, are very strong in telling us uh, interesting stories, uh, unique stories about these issues through their artistic practice. And they will be here until the end of November, mid-November. Mid -November. So uh, please do say hello. And uh, this is a, a chance to kind of get introduced. And if you see them on campus wandering about, to introduce yourselves, you know, spread the conversation. And that's what we want. Like, we really want to have a chance to have artists be amidst um, us and have an opportunity to have conversations and dialogues. And new thinking will grow. So, uh, so let me introduce our visiting artist fellows uh, who will tell us about their practice and we'll open it up to Q&A and, and so I think how is the deck uh, 
This is should I call uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So oh, I will I, I think I'll introduce each artist and have a presentation and the uh, yeah, is that the case? Okay. okay, so first we have Karima Gupta who comes to us from New Delhi. Uh, and Garima is a graduate of communication design from the National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad, in India, which she graduated in 2007. And I know Vishal Kandelal, my colleague, really wanted to be here, but there's another contemporary art, if you can believe, event happening at top. So he had to go to attend that lecture. So he's not here, but uh, he has written and he's working on a history of National Institute of oh, Design. Oh, interesting. So I, I wanted to mention this to you. Um, and so she has an artist residency in the School of Visual Art in 2013. And since 2014, she has done research and film work in illegal wildlife markets of Southeast and South Asia. She uh, maps effects of colonial British and Dutch visual and material language on drivers of contemporary wildlife uh, markets. And she presented an intermediate stage solo show titled Minutes of the Meeting at Clark. House initiative in 2017, and uh, her five-year-long research project based on field work in Papua New Guinea and Southeast Asian archipelago culminated into a solo show titled Filed Under uh, colon A slash news slash um, <laughs> you get that together, right? Um, at Clark Mumbai in 2020. And I I, there are many, many more shows that I could mention that she's part of, but I actually wanted to say that from her artist statement, she actually, her field work com comprised in drawing, like filmmaking and writing as a petition for fringe narratives and failing archives, speculating, fabulating that which is not uttered and seldom imagined. And uh, a recent site of her inquiry include the Mahakali River on the Indian Nepal border. And I've learned about her project actually uh, dealing with the extinction of species in Southeast Asia, especially Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, and Thailand during the pandemic in a virtual workshop. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> that yes, uh, hosted by the Louis Wolfel Library of New oh, yes. <laughs> titled Viewing Photography <laughs> Across the Globe series workshop. Yeah. Second, uh, the second workshop on indigeneity. Right. And I was impressed by her. Uh, the paper was actually. She presented alongside Chitra Rama, Ramalingam of the Yale Center for British Art. The paper was titled Anxiety of a Bazaar, Making of Commodities in Colonial South and Southeast Asia. And it, during the presentation, I found her work uh, really moving and thought provoking. And I was really delighted to see her <laughs> application come into our lab. <laughs> and, and I was excited to learn about your move to build an archive that encompasses, I could you, social, political, and ecological micro narratives of the Mahathali River in the area around the Indian and Nepal border uh, documenting wildlife trade in Indonesia. So that's sort of the context <laughs> in which we're going to think about Karima's work. And without further ado, can we welcome Karima to this session? Hello everyone. As of like 5.45, I was getting messages saying that people can't make it, but it's like given those messages, this room is still fairly full. So I'm really delighted to see all of you here. Thank you for making the time for us. Um, and yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it's nice if I talk when it's dark, so I don't get very anxious about things. <laughs> Okay, so briefly about my practice. Um, 10 years ago, I was a normal person going to an office. I had a nine to five job. I was thoroughly depressed. <laughs> and at this job, at the said job, um, I used to sit in my corner and I used to watch videos of birds. Uh, Especially during that time, I was really fascinated with the species called birds of paradise that are endemic to uh, Papua New Guinea. And contrary to um, <laughs> everyone else's opinion, I wasn't being paid to watch these videos. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So I will show you a snippet of this video that was made by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology just to set us in that um, frame of mind and like where I'm coming from. They go from expected to extraordinary in the blink of an eye. You're awestricken. So they transform themselves to something that you've never seen before. They swagger and serenade. They dance and display. They're unlike any creatures on earth and one of the most astounding phenomena ever witnessed. The birds of paradise. Yeah. I, if that doesn't uh, spin your head a little bit, then maybe the next 10, 15 minutes will be a little tough. <laughs> but yeah, like, I mean, I was watching these videos and I was um, thoroughly amazed and so like mesmerized that by, I think I must have watched these videos for a whole year and then saved some money. And I said, okay, Tata, bye bye. <laughs> I'm leaving for the island because I wanted to see the birds for myself. Um, so um, I went from Bombay to Kuala Lumpur, Kuala Lumpur to Jakarta, Jakarta to Surabaya, Surabaya to Manado, Manado to Manokwari mm -hmm. to reach the island of Papua New Guinea. <laughs> and it is over there that I met this gentleman called Zeth. And I mean, I'll tell you a bit of a story so that it kind of like, um, you know, tells you what time of the year this was. This was October in 2014. And this is the time when scientists and ornithologists have sort of like petered out of the island because it's uh, the bird mating season has sort of ended at this time or is ending towards this time. Um, I still happen to see two birds in the rainforest. That's the rainforest on the right. Um, but yeah, like it was filled with a lot of gaps here and there where I would sit down with Zeth and Zeth would tell me stories about the rainforest when he was a kid growing up here. And among those stories was a story of how he used to hunt these birds as a three, four, five year old kid. Um, everything aside, like I think when I came back, what stayed with me was the fact that if he was killing birds, who was buying them? <clears throat> a little bit of going back into the story. So these birds are ceremoniously used in their traditional dances, largely as headgears that men wear. But I want to point out this little object over here. And I want to tell you a story of a trade that started happening in these birds. This is around the 16th century when the Dutch were just about settling in, uh, in the entire archipelago of Southeast Asia. So that's all of um, Indonesia up till, up till some bits of uh, Papua New Guinea. And these birds started traveling with these traders into Europe. Now, if you look at these two paintings, uh, they're also roughly around the same time. And we see these birds being worn by largely figures that look like traders, um, but also that they've entered into the mainstream uh, visual material culture of Europe. This is a fascinating object from Nepal. Now you think, 
how did this land up in Nepal? That's a very good question. Um, this is the tail of the same bird. So now, the point I'm making is that there was a lot of reverence for these birds. Um, and the re reason there was reverence is because there was a lot of mystique created around these birds. Nobody, uh, at least nobody of European origin had ever seen these birds alive. So the narrative was that these are beautiful, white, floating birds that rest on the clouds and drink dew. Um, uh, <laughs> And there were like, if there were ethnographers, they were talking about how these birds flash through the air and look like fire. Um, so yeah, like, I mean, that was creating a lot of hype in the European uh, imagination for these birds. And they were landing up in different parts of the uh, world, but only as very exotic, very expensive, one of a kind objects. But that wasn't the story in the 17th century when the mystique kind of died, the poetic references died, and these birds started landing up in Paris as hats. And that's where our story begins. <clears throat> this is around the same time, it's from the D Dutch archives, and here we see hundreds and thousands of birds being plundered out of the island. So yeah, I mean, back to me. Uh, that's me traveling in one little rickety plane that had no seat belts, and we land up in Papua New Guinea. This is the very beginning of my practice, so to say. Um, I was a budget traveler because nobody was funding this work, and on a budget airline, which is the norm in Southeast Asia, you can at max carry seven to nine kgs. So that was my only source of um, artwork making practice. And that's my notebook from that time. And I mean, I'm not an artist yet. <laughs> at least in my head, I'm not an artist. But I go back to Bombay and Somebody sees my work on Facebook, as is the world that Jina <laughs> has <laughs> shown us, and called me and said, hey, why don't you come and show us your work? And I mean, this is a little later in time, but this was at this moment in time that we've seen these uh, drawings and they said, come, come, present your work. And I was like, you're mad. I'm not presenting 15 drawings and making a fool of myself. Um, but I did accept the offer eventually. Uh, and I, this is my first artwork, so to say. Um, and I'm, I'm not really like married to the artwork, but I think one is when it's a moment in time when you kind of change as a person. Uh, so this is a drawing, painting, whatever you may call it, where I'm just notifying the numbers that I read in the data sets. So many birds pulled out. There are there are data uh, sets that say eighty thousand birds pulled out in one particular year, and I'm just like, okay, that makes no sense to me. I'm going to draw that. Uh, so that's one of my first artworks. A little later in time, I'm now fully invested in this narrative of trade that is happening in Birds of Paradise, and I solicit random people on Instagram who may look like they might lead me somewhere. So this is a taxidermist that I start talking to. Um, that's a real chat from our DMs. And we start talking about how much are people buying birds for, who's buying them, how much are you getting for them. And the other day someone asked me, so what do, what do people do? Like, what's the kind of money? I think Hitesh, you asked me that question. Uh, what do people do with this kind of money? And like I have different references in Bali, kids buy, kill these birds and buy an iPhone. So a couple of years ago, that was the iPhone rate and that was the money that was they were getting. But taxidermists like this gentleman can make like $3,000 to $4,000. So I finally um, pestered him enough into meeting me and he comes to so the same taxidermist, he comes to a coffee shop with an Adidas bag filled with the birds that we're talking about. Uh, 
but like that was a different story altogether like it was kind of like all these episodes have been changing me as a person more than my art changing anyone else's perspective on this up until time up until this point i am a group i can't go to a chicken well like poultry shop and buy myself a chicken cuz like in india they will hack it in front of you and i can't watch it so my dad goes in, into the shop and i stand outside uh but this episode happens he shows me these birds and says hey you want to come see me like cut open a bird i said okay of course i'm here i'm <laughs> i'm here to live the moment i will come <laughs> So I mean, now I'm going to show you some artworks and tell the story of this episode. This is around four o'clock in Bangkok. It's musty. It's hot. A um, lot of sounds in the street. Um, peddlers <laughs> selling their wares. Uh, there's a full-on market happening. We go up to the first floor of this uh, taxidermist. He offers us these. drinks that are orange and green in color filled with ice we sit down he said what should i open cut open for you <laughs> i said whatever you're in the mood for um so he opens a deep freeze and brings out a dead peacock he opens a packet of these surgical gloves starts wearing them and starts cutting the peacock and i want you to reflect on this moment cuz for me it was just i think it altered me personally cuz i think i had to deal with like so many emotions at this moment not as somebody who can't who has some moral ethical issues about like a bird a dead bird being cut open uh but just like finding my space in this world that i had cut for myself where i said okay i'm going to be this artist that is in the field and not at in the studio and i'm going to find out for myself what is this real world that engages in this trade but here i am sipping on my orange cola and watching him cut open a uh, peacock and that led to obviously that led to a lot many other questions that were surrounding this market for example the idea of why is this trade happening what is happening in the background of this trade and largely the point is that we are losing a lot of um habitat animal habitat wildlife habitat um and so i mean i'll quickly go through this this is the moment in time when scientists from malaysia find out that there is a weevil in africa that they can bring to indonesia to uh, expedite pollination of palm oil i'm pretty sure like a lot of you sitting here know what palm oil is um this is the said weevil and among many other there's mining that's happening in the region this is gold mining that's happening in papua new guinea uh yeah i think this is the last slide i want to leave you at um it largely reflects the market itself uh this is an artwork that i made last to last year and it's it's sort of like a shopping bag crumpled has a lot of animals in it kind of reflects all the field work that i've done all the wet markets all the wildlife markets that i've been to and at least like in that moment it seems like everything is for sale and nothing is for sale um like where have we landed up um yeah i mean <laughs> that's what i've been doing all this while but currently uh as of 2020 i have moved my field of um my field work to india nepal border where i'm looking at illegal tra uh, trade in wildlife Uh, and that's what i've been doing and i'd love to hear from any one of you who's engaged in similar kind of work or like is looking at um species that are being traded uh, endangered at the border the pangolins the tigers so anyone who's engaged in that kind of work i'd love to hear from you thank you so much
All right, so we'll question and answer to like after the both of this presentation. So um, yeah, is that okay? So thank you for that, Karina. And, and um, next, we have Top Shiva, who's a photographer and a former cop, policeman from Karnataka. And his application was perhaps one of the most unusual applications that we received, uh, as we often get applications from artists who are kind of trained in art schools or have sort of some sort of academic, longer academic trajectory and backgrounds. So it was quite unusual. And I know you already have a cult following. So <laughs> everyone that we like we heard about was like, oh my God, he's coming. That's amazing. So that, that was the response. So I knew we have a street cadence here. So Kapshiva migrated from his village in Karnataka's rural district to join the Indian police service in 2001. Moving to Bangalore was challenging for him, but it also allowed him to pursue a career in art and photography. In 2007, he began working as a coordinator of uh, One Chanti Road Contemporary Art Gallery. And since then, he has received grants from esteemed organizations like, a, uh, like the Swiss Art Council, Pro Hiveltia, and the Swedish Art Council. Uh, Kopsheva is also the recipient of the Sovereign Asian Art Public Award 2023. This is very recently announced, I, I, I've seen. Um, so congratulations. Thank you. His work has been accepted in galleries in India and internationally, and I think many of you <laughs> must already know his work. So as you will see, in, uh, his artistic practice as a photographer developed uh, over time based on his personal experience of moving to a big city like Bangalore from a rural area. And his position and experience as a policeman kind of granted him access to most intimate and rarely seen moments of the city life, especially of the city's migrant workers. And so I did a Google search of what's the population of Bangalore's migrant workers. And there is a data, actually, from 2020, data from Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore, that's 42 lakh migrant laborers. That makes about 44% of the city's total population. So it's a almost half the city's population is migrant laborers. And that often suffers and lives without much amenities or dignity for that matter. And in a way, through his streets and studio project, he provides a space and memory to these migrant workers to see their dream realized. And in a way, dignity restored. So the selection committee was particularly drawn to his unusual background and approach to representing migrant workers through his art, making invisible dreams visible in a way. So both of you are kind of making invisible visible. So, yeah. all right, without further ado. Thank you for all coming and thank you so much for Middle Institute, Itesh, Jina, Sneha, running this great initiative to support South Asian artists. So finally, I didn't actually. I I born brought up in a small remote village close to Bangalore because I I didn't study much. I quit. I'm I was 15 years old. I I quit high school. when I finished my high school. I quit because one fine day my father disappeared. Then I wanted to support my mother and two sisters. So thank you, Middle Institute. They finally they allow me to join college three weeks back. Really, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. So finally, because <laughs> so when I was 21 year old, I joined Karnataka Police because when I was high school, you know, I'm a long distance runner, 1,500 meter national junior. Then you know, I couldn't pursue that as an athlete also because of life, you know, struggle life. So because of that quota, I joined, I got uh, got selected to police and then, you know, then I ran for a police department some few years. Then one, you know, in the hostel I used to live, one day, they used to give every morning one boy day, but then I asked them, give me two. So <laughs> then, then they put me in the traffic police. <laughs> so... I, in my like 18 years, my police career, I work like a many different kind of department, like a law and order, traffic police, crime, and uh, control room. And before I leave, like a six years, I work in a prison, like a thousand six hundred prisoners. Yeah. So you know that is a really is a big challenge and great experience I had. So then, how I started my photography journey? Because I lived, you know, I lived surrounded by like you know the uh, great mountains and like a temple. And my grandfather, like a theater actor, is lots of like a you know, mythological theater group. 
So my grandfather wanted me to always like an artist, you know, then I lost him when I was seven year old. So then anyway, then, you know, then whatever, then I couldn't get opportunity to learn art in institution, but I, I lived surrounded with like, you know, art and art and culture. So then when I was like, you know, I'm, I'm always like a keen to learn art, then I'm hunting, how can I pursue my art career? Like in 2006, then, you know, I found this one Shanti Road Studio Gallery, the, you know, then I asked the director, can I come and help you? He said, fine. Then I start like a volunteerly start helping. Then the institution, the one Shanti Road, mainly run a residency program. They work with many international artists. Then, you know, I start helping artists and then I start, showing the city, I start buying material, and then I start uh, documenting them practice during the residency program. So that is the turning point in my life, you know, I start using small Sony camera. So in the, during the One Shanti Road time, you know, I work with many, like, you know, national, international artists. I saw them practice very closely. So then that moment I thought, okay, so enough looking, then I want to create my own art. So then already I'm start using photo camera, then I bought a camera and then I start taking photo, you know, then the medium allowed me to express my feelings. Suddenly my life got sense, you know, then I never looked back. So thanks to my police duty, you know, then they allow me to look society in a different way. So then I used to hold, you know, rifle and like, you know, lati. Then, you know, I now I start using camera to bring light for, you know, neglected part of the society. So my practice mainly focuses like, you know, like a, a common people, you know, like is so many extraordinary people in this society. You know, they're all like a hidden for a mainstream. So then throughout my work, you know, then I wanted to give voice and platform um, throughout my work. So, okay, so now I'm going to talk about one of my, like a long-term project, you know, so called Street Has Studio. This body of work, you know, 2016, I was got nominated for a PBD Archaeology Museum. They have a Robert Gardner Fellowship. So now the current, my fellowship, then I'm doing a research about Robert Gardner, like, you know, the films and archive, because we, our work is both similar. So, you know, street always for me so fascinate, you know, then I worked seven years as a traffic police, then I used to patrolling, you know, different kind of street, avenue, and like a gully. So, you know, then where, you know, people comes and goes, you know, where life like a fold and unfold and the dynamic energy always I like by street. So during 2006, you know, the Bangalore City Corporation, they wanted to show city like a Singapore. So then they commissioned some mural painters to make entire city like a murals. You know, that murals represent like a glory of Karnataka, the Karnataka, the state we live. So, you know, the, the, the monument, like a historical persons, you know, God, goddesses. So they're all really beautiful and like, you know, it's very colorful. So personally, you know, I connected with all these murals. I was there as a police. And then, you know, I'm always fascinated about Indian studio photography. So now studio photography now no, not, no anymore exist in India, you know, but still uh, you can see most of the people houses, you know, some photographs still we have like a memory. So then, you know, then I thought, you know, then always I wanted to work about like the, the immigrant issue because myself has a, you know, uh, uh, born in village, then I'm moving to city to find my life, you know, it's not so easy. So I know so many immigrants, you know, they all came with a, like a dream to find their life. And, you know, they do like, you know, is the many different kind of job, you know, the street vendors, sex workers, folk dancers, and like, you know, the uh, uh, many, many varieties, some of them working in the hotel, but mainly they don't get paid well also, you know, the, but still they can't go back, but still they're struggling to survive. So they don't have much education also. They don't have much education. So then, you know, then I start, like, you know, I start taking these, like, extraordinary people that in front of this great murals. So we can see some of the photograph. Then I continue explaining a little bit more. We have limited time, you know, then I can, we can see some of the images. <laughs> So this is the baby used to beg in the signal. Then, you know, then anyway, finally, I I and some of my friends find 
some grab uh, like a uh, ngo to you know give food and some education now is like you know like a 12 years old and then he going school so this is the the daily laborer working in the like you know the city market you know the where like a wholesale like a vegetable market sure on ओके <laughs> So this is the one like a construction worker son. This is as it is. They sell like you know the onion on the street. These two because you know then I I know these people they they do like a, the the puncture the cycle the tire puncturing job his father does you know I this father wanted these two kids with them they have this like a goat like a pet. so they bring with a the small like a truck and they said okay take photo because that signal is like the traffic is heavy but you know then they wanted it that way because i i i took it <laughs> this is a folk performance they perform in the street again the folk farmers you know they are also go to like a different street every day and you know they 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 beg and they collect money <laughs> this is the very traditional like we call like a kilu kudre kilu kudre like a kilu kudre means like a horse dance you know this is very traditional now is is most of them you know most of the traditional also is like a slowly 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 they disappearing also so you know the, the i'm glad you know still certain things and i i documented again this construction working they working in a construction site okay so this is the guy you know then he came then he working like a gym instructor and then i wanted him to be pose then he is very shy to stand in the signal then i finally i convince his girlfriend he came along with his girlfriend and he posed for me <laughs> so this is the he he consider as a she he is he is a choreographer used to be in mumbai now he moving to bangalore and he sell all this jewelry near that muslim dargah so i wanted his photograph then he said okay i will i will give you some different dance pose you can take photo then i did same coming from different state and selling candy near schools <laughs> so this is like a, when i met is a engineering student then anyway i is not you don't like to tell his real name is is okay is anyway she then she is, is he wanted to call as she she wanted to be a pure women so she stopped studying and then she start working sex work and then then i want actually she wanted to fly like a bird so anyway then she chose this mural and then then i went actually that also is a busy signal they have a near one palace like a busy crowded place and i'm taking photo all the men are standing they think oh what a beautiful figure where you bring this figure <laughs> so they they they're all like you know the teasing so this is again you know this is the construction worker kids so is most of this 90% of the murals now disappear you know so only some few left you know then um, in when covid came you know people are moved and you know uh, some phone connection i used to have i have only little now you know they keep on moving keep on changing but but still i have like you know then uh, the i have a uh, 300 images and then i have un unforgettable stories and then i am planning to make a book you know then i made a book also dummy book you know that i'm i'm looking for a publishers any publishers <laughs> around book is dummy book is ready so then we can see more pictures the the mango seller <laughs> it is proud about his mustache 
is a dog taking care of women, you know, she has this fancy dog. This particular picture I got like a 2017 is a national award. This this particular picture, like, you know, I tried like a three years to take this this goddesses photo because when these goddesses come like almost like a, lots of people like a 400 500 people with these goddesses then is is very difficult to get single picture somehow i use my police <laughs> hour and then i talk to some leader then he told me only two minutes will give you you have to get it so anyway i got it <laughs> The gas cylinder in India, we sell cylinder, we don't have like you know, so like here. Mm -hmm. So, this man, like a teaching English in like a slum, is a Christian, like a priest, he goes in a different kind of slum to teach English. Okay, thank you. We can talk more about in question. So question now, more question. Yeah, no. We are ready. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, thank you both for this wonderful presentations, and uh, yeah, we can just be like looking at the pictures and, and hearing stories. So I, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna just open it up to audience questions because I want to actually have artists have a chance to pull responses from. Don't be afraid. I'm not any more police. <laughs> I'm coming from India to here it's too far, like almost twenty-two hour journey. I need some questions. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I agree. Um, it's very captivating, very amazing. Uh, like most of these photos are featured against the you know, amazing graffiti and wild paintings. Is there any story behind that for the music? No, no, no. That is like a local, the city corporation, they wanted to show city like a Singapore. So they made an entire city, the street, they decorated with these murals. So then I used as a studio and then I I took this immigrant photos in the happy, happy way. Yeah. That's not really religious. Yeah. <laughs> I, I used to work there in the same street. Yeah. So do you actually, like, you must know all the murals in the I know, I know, I know, I know, now. because I worked 18 years, I know city well, I know the murals, then, you know, I documented just mural first, and then I place the people to take photo. Mm -hmm. So you choose the mural and the person. Some of them they choose, some of them I choose, or this is like a collaborative. So I show them murals, and then sometimes they choose, sometimes I choose. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much, both of y'all, the, the work is just beautiful, and I'm speechless but i'm going to ask a question um india is so diverse right how do you choose your people because in that one street you can see diversity like every second person is different what made you like select a certain person no i don't select generally the non-judgmental because then you know the you know i met like a people like and i know some of them you know i throw them i met you know my cousin my uncle my friend you know once you start taking photo i i give them photo back i printed photo so then they saying okay some the, my friend one my cousin want and i think i never like you know always most important for me i learn when i start taking this all photos you know just i'm hearing them because these all people have like a andre stories and start hearing you know that my work is done so i know no no judgment i know i understand that like in you know, all this food i i never ask then you know, a way which caste you know what they eat you know india that is a big complication now you know then which caste and what they eat you know no i don't have that because because of my police duty you know then i worked as a police you know then uh, that's helped me to work this project mm -hmm. yeah. 
this is interesting because you are connecting these things with migration. That's an important aspect. But the story of migration is also changing. For instance, in COVID time, the migration became an important issue and it also like to the different discourse. So do you see the changes that, uh, that are you capturing the changes that we see in the migration story through your Pictures because, because migration, you know, for me, the, you can go to the topic about migration, or you see sad picture. I think today morning I'm talking to someone else, you know, always we see sad, you know, some baby died near the sea, you know, some people, some, some people are walking 100 kilometers without food, you know, it's always you see sad things. Also, I don't want to, because myself also, you know, then like a migrant when I moved to Bangalore, I don't know what to do because I, when I was 15, then I moved to Bangalore, I worked like a five years as a salesman i used to sell some cosmetic product door to door because you know then i also have a feeling i also have like you know i wanted to show myself like a happy way I, happy things also you know then that's why i decided you know why i want to show these people like you know in in a sad way you know they also have a life they also have a feeling let's 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 take them photo in little happiness you know then ask them how you want photo some of them come with their own dress you know own makeup and own pet, you know, then that, that, that I actually then I choose that way. I should show in a sad way also. I don't want to. Because when I'm making book, you know, then I don't want to tell each picture story also. You know, this I don't want to make sad. I wanted to show beautiful these people. They, the spirit, these people have in the spirit, you know, they they living they they're surviving, you know, in the in the city, whatever, you know. That means you don't want to bring have difficulties. Yes, yes, exactly, 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 exactly. But already, you know, difficulties you will be seeing everywhere because I don't want to show throughout my picture the the sad the difficulties, you know, the struggling things and all. I have a question. I just wanted to ask you now, looking at the pictures, I can see like these are like unlike us who are like always excited to, to take our pictures, pose uh, all the time. These people are from, from like the lower or lower middle class state of our society, how easy or how difficult was it for you to convince them to post for your pictures? So I know some of them throughout my police duty and then, you know, then actually I have more empathy and then how to work with public also. You know, the job is help me to work with this kind of people. Generally, you know, then I'm, I'm not just taking photo with them. Just I, I meet them, I discuss with them, I have chai with them, I have lunch with them. Sometimes I go to them son birthday, I go to them uncle birthday or marriage. <laughs> so, you know, you have to part of that life also, you know, then they feel comfortable. They will allow you to take photo however you want. You know, that is very collaborative. I don't want to go just randomly take photo. Okay, I want to take photo. No, I don't want to do that. I want to connect with subject. I want to connect that human when i taking photograph. You know, that is the way I did like a 300 portraits. Thank you. Hitesh, you had a question? I did. So, you know, both of these are, uh, first of all, thank you to both of you. Both of these are about certain kinds of juxtapositions. Uh, and you've talked about some of those. And Garima, I want to ask you, the juxtapositions in your art are also very profound for me, but they're more almost imaginary. So you're dealing with birds, which we often think of as uh, symbols of absolute freedom. That they've been captured and killed <laughs> and are being sliced in front of you. I mean, what an extraordinary juxtaposition. Some of the images that you have, so for example, of that glove, mm -hmm. which is so well uh, drawn uh, that you feel the texture of it. You know, it made, my first thought when I looked at it was, oh gosh, if I were illustrating Kabir's genie genie Jadaria, I could use this. Uh, drawing, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a meditation on, uh, it means this thin, thin sheet, meaning the skin which covers us, how how uh, how subtle and uh, translucent. translucent and delicate life is, and you're just, mm -hmm. we could all be dead tomorrow, not you, but me, <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, and this, how close we are at death's door at every moment. So do you think of those things as you are also composing your work? Uh, I mean, I thought of a lot of things because right about the time that I was drawing that, there was COVID all around us. And there were so many, uh, so many of these blue um, mm -hmm. gloves all around us. And I mean, to be very honest, I drew them because I bought them because I was paranoid. Like the family was paranoid. So they were like, oh, buy gloves. And I was like, hmm, I want to draw that. 
<laughs> yeah, but like, you're right. I mean, multiple things come to mind. Um, also for me, this series was about, so they're also named after the timestamp uh, as and when this whole operation was taking place in front of me. Um, so I was thinking about the time of the day and I was thinking about how for him it was like a very common everyday um, action and for how for me like I was just in some other world in that moment because I mean a lot of people have said that this was a very out of body experience for me to sit there and like watch him because at one point he was like oh I think it died because there was corn stuck in his throat and he's pulling out like these bits and pieces of corn <laughs> And I'm thinking of a thousand things that are happening. I'm thinking of how his freezer is full of birds, how the place that I'm sitting in is surrounded by dead animals, how uh, he, while doing it, is you know, sipping on that orange sloppy, how morbid this situation is. <laughs> uh, and what am I doing of all people in this place? How did I track him down? It took me three weeks to track him down. He wouldn't pick up my calls. Uh, we were texting and then he disappeared on me. And I was thinking, what is going on in this world and what is going on in my world and where am I sitting? What is going on? How am I ever going to like draw this out for someone else to even be remotely in my shoes? Uh, and I mean, even the drawing after this, uh, the peacock drawing, I drew it on the paper that uh, the gloves come in. Uh, so this is like a sheet that they powder it, powder the sheet, put gloves in, wrap it up. And I think for the most part, I was just trying to not just like figuratively draw it um, to like transport you back into that moment, but also like, these smaller, like, uh, at least in my head, head, these are like significant things that were happening. Um, I was trying to connect dots uh, of that moment. And it's, I know it's like, it's impossible for me to transport you into that moment, but like, if at all, momentarily, I could tell you about that episode, this would be the way I would tell you about it. Very powerful how you've done it, where you've spared us the most gory parts where she put the glove where the action was. Just one quick follow-up, because Nadeep talked a lot about his relationships with these people. Sorry? Uh, the relationship with the people that you met is, is from, from the rainforest yeah. to Bangkok, right? Yes. These must have been intense relationships. Also. Oh, yes. And I met Zeth twice. Uh, he's the hunter in the first image. And the next time he saw me in 2016, he was like, hey, you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just bizarre because for them also, I'm not a common factor in life. I'm not an ornithologist. I'm not a scientist. I don't have any funding. They don't see me repeatedly. I'm all but like a gisa pita, what you call traveler, right? Like uh, that finds some money here and there, goes someplace, does some work. But for him to see me repeat, like, you know, again and again, it was like, we had a bond there. Um, and the funny thing was, like, I didn't know I was going to come back in 2016. So he brought out his register in which everyone writes their names and writes when did they come back. So the next time I went, he said, hey, I'll show you the register. He would put your name in. <laughs> and that was like, you know, just like a like an interesting thing to see. And right, like even with a taxidermist, um, it's a bond that you make um, over like a long period of time. Like for, he and I were talking for a year before I landed up in Bangkok. And then he went missing on me because he thought like, I was like, oh, she finally landed up? Maybe she has like some reasons, you know? Like there's always a threat of being caught, being reprimanded. And yeah, it took me three weeks to like convince him to meet up with me. 
with an Adidas bag. <laughs> but the, does he know that what you were purpose was actually or? Yes. So I did eventually tell, I mean, like when we finally spoke and he said, no, I don't want to meet you because I'm a little scared. And I said, listen, I'm not important in this entire schema. Right? It's like nobody's like listening to what I have got to say, which is very true. In front of the uh, conservationists, scientists, and in that scheme, I'm very low on the hierarchy. Uh, and I said, listen, like if ever it came down to like, uh, me publishing this book, make sure that I, I'm, in that sense, I'm working as a journalist, your name will never come out, uh, where you live will never come out, none of that. So even if, eventually when I wrote about all of this, I never mentioned his name, I never let out his details. It's like fascinating to see how the relationships yeah. of people that yeah. actually come through and go, where are people both? I know that there was a question yeah. meeting here. You pronounce the Indian names very correctly, like Ramalinga. I was watching. <laughs> <laughs> so about mutiny, my interest is, since I'm from biology, you know that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> my interest is about the anthropology of the people in New Guinea. So now, more than 25 years ago, Harvard geneticist by name Richard Spencer proposed a hypothesis that Africans reached New Guinea, Australia, things like that, via India. But now some people dispute that it's not for India. So then in your interaction, did you ask them how, <laughs> how, they, what did, how they came there? The, the reason I'm mentioning is yeah. there is a belief that the gypsies in East Europe came from India. Mm -hmm. And someone recently interacted with them and asked, do you know we came from India? They didn't know. So that's why that's one question I have. Then other thing about Shiva is Shiva and I come from the same city. Only thing the difference is I'm older than him. So I was there before. <laughs> now values change a lot. I was there for 25 years. I grew up, I studied and worked. So I then I left Bengaluru. At that time, the population was less than a million. You can imagine less than a million. Now it's my last visit was in 2020, but I was there just visiting Bangalore University and teaching a course there and immediately return. These paintings are they all over Bangalore? Or? All over Bangalore. Somehow in, they were there before 2020. You come, let me know when you come in next time. I will show you some of them. <laughs> you said they're mostly gone now, or a few left because now like 80 percent were gone. Like a, some, like a, generally the uh, corporation, you know, they wanted to keep on. The corrupted, they keep on painting and you know, they repaint and do things and all. Yeah, so to answer your question, Mr. Gandhi, I've been to both sides of the island. Uh, so one, if you imagine the island in the shape of the bird, it's actually cut half in the middle. The right hand side is an independent nation, and the left hand side is under the Indonesian government now because it used to be a Dutch colony, but, yes. and eventually, when they uh, handed over the land back, it became an Indonesian um, thing. And you wouldn't believe that people on either side don't want to admit that the other side looks like them. <laughs> they keep asking me, do they look like us? Do they talk like us? And so, I mean, I don't know if they know anything about African ancestry. They don't know that on either sides of the border, they are the same people. So, I mean, that's oh gosh, <laughs> that's our reality anywhere. Like I, my my grandparents came from Pakistan, but as of today, like we have absolutely zero connection, zero uh, reflection on the point. Like the point that we're forgetting that partition never happened. Uh, coming down to a generation after me, people will not know that just partition happened or that, you know, they were the same people across the border, right? Sure, so he, our memory is very fickle, right? yeah. So I don't think they'll be able to answer your question. <laughs> okay, so I saw a question, Janet, you had a hand up? Yes, yes. Um, just Excellent. Thank you. Um, I, it's probably the thing that's been in my homework and in some painting, drawing, as well, so personal. 
and it probably nothing to do with what you do at all. But I was just wondering whether your the school if there's anything that inspired you because this might just quick into say company painting, right? And not just the style of the composition very bold, but also they have different concerns and interests in wild different from yours, but they can actually make quite an interesting conversation. Um, is that something that you have looked at or interested in, or is your source of inspiration something else altogether? I mean, of course, like you can't deny that that visual culture is so like all around us and so seeped into us. <laughs> right? And you can't uh, run away from it. But I think the way I uh, negotiate that space is that what is the impetus? behind doing that work. Um, ethnographers who were in South Asia had a very uh, clear brief from the company that yes. we are documenting these so that we can use them for our advantage. Um, I think that there itself are uh, the ideas of what we're doing are very different. But yes, I have thought about how these graphic drawings often have very similar tonality. Uh, to those kind of gra um, graphic drawings. And I think, like in this particular one, I mean, I often think about it and I think it was a very like decisive moment on at which I chose to draw it on the surgical gloves paper and not on a plain sheet of paper because I think that was me uh, situating you into my context. Um, yeah. And I think these are the kind of decisions that I've often made, either very knowingly or very like, you know, instinctively yeah. that have, uh, <laughs> I would say like, kind of like uh, worked in my head and I've worked for the body of work that I create. Uh, I, I would love to get another chat with you because I just think that, the, you know, if you were to look at because of different concerns, and it could make a very interesting conversation. Right. But and this drawing is uh, the original drawing is upstairs. Please come have a look at it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also, if I may, um, museum, and we have, um, so you know, you know, if you like to come look. Of course, like I'd love to. I'd love to. Yes, well, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and just one very quick um, observation interesting about the photographs. The street photographs, you were saying you don't want to portray the migrant workers as sad, um, you know, because there's enough hardship already in their life. In some ways, what I think to me, what makes your photograph richer, because there is actually, to me, another sadness because of it, because you're photographing these people, they're aiming to the city against murals that are actually not the real city. So it's this additional alienness that brings up the sadness in not an immediate mm -hmm. apparent way. That makes the work really multi-layered. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I, the, Janet, thank you for that comment. So Janet is our a new color a fellow at the Harvard Art Museum working on Indian Islamic uh, painting collections. So uh, thank you for those comments. And I, I've just realized actually, I, when I was preparing for this if even this event, when looking through your slide decks, I didn't think I saw a lot of sort of like connectivities. But as we sort of we discussed all around, I think there is a lot of connectivities between the two uh, artists here. That I I think there is also like such a strong presence of or looming backdrop of colonial artistic practices, where you know studio photography mm -hmm. or the you know company painting and ethnographic documentation. So both of them kind of, in terms of their visual quality, they might look, not look as similar, but I think there's, so those, I think that period is looming large here uh, with both of your work. So that's quite, uh, and thank you all for these uh, wonderful comments, questions, and I think we can, uh, wrap up and, and um, some work in four yes, floor we can display. actually go and up and, and uh, some look at yeah, look at the work. Thank you. Thank you.